Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Stephen Fagan, and on behalf of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza and our CEO, Nicola Longford, I'd like to welcome you here tonight for a very special program with a longtime friend of our institution, Dr. Josiah Tink Thompson, a uh, one-time philosophy professor, right. uh, a private investigator, and uh, most significant for us here tonight, a first-generation Kennedy assassination researcher whose 1967 book, Six Seconds in Dallas, is a classic in the history of assassination literature. So, Tink, we're so thrilled you could be here tonight. You Glad have, to be. You have prepared a, a wonderful presentation that you're going to be giving in a few minutes based on your new book, Last Second in yeah. Dallas. But we wanted to start things off tonight with a little bit of historical context. As I understand it, you really got started in this case because you got arrested in 1966. Right. Can, can you start there and tell us a little bit about that? No. It's not embarrassing at all to get arrested for what I got arrested for, to begin with. Uh, I was living in Haverford, Pennsylvania. It's a suburb of, of Philadelphia. And uh, the sheriff of Delaware County announced on TV and various things, if any of these peaceniks come into my district, I'm going to bust them, right? So, of course, Bill Davidon and I, Bill Davidon, professor of physics, and I went to Delaware County the next morning and began distributing um, Quaker leaflets on the conflict in Vietnam. We were busted almost immediately and taken off to jail. And four hours later, an ACLU lawyer appeared to get us out. And we were taken out of the, our cell and put in the squad room where all the, all the officers gathered around. And the ACLU lawyer put on a brilliant show, just a brilliant show. He kept looking at his watch and he said to the assembled officers around us, he said, now, um, we've been in touch with Attorney General Katzenbach, I believe it was, and the FBI agents will be here soon. He looks at his watch, and they all look at their watches. And uh, when the agents get here, I want you to tell them that not only have your civil rights been violated, but you're suing for false arrest. Captain so-and-so, lieutenant so-and-so, sergeant so-and-so, and patrolman, blah, 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 blah. We were out of there in 40 seconds. 40 <laughs> seconds. And that, <laughs> that ACLU lawyer was Vince Salandria, who was, was one of the originals in, in this whole battle. And uh, after that, Vince and I became friends, and he, we would drive to Washington together where we go to the National Archives, and Marion Johnson, an archivist, would bring us back down the latest releases from the Warren Commission, because they were in process of releasing documents. But each time we'd go there, there'd, there'd be a new set. So uh, Vince and I persevered in this way from, let's see, the arrest, I think, was in January or February 1966, and we were doing this up through July. You got to see the Zapruder film for the first time at the National Archives. Give us a sense of what it was like to see that for the first time. Blew my mind. Blew my mind. The archives at that point had a second-rate copy of the Zapruder film. And it was either in 16 millimeter or 8 millimeter, I forget it this time. But a poor, a poor copy, which they ran and screened for us. And they also had 35 millimeter slides, which weren't that good either. But Vince had told me of the work of a guy named Ray Marcus, who claimed that he had been able to see in some bootleg Zapruder film that the president's head moved forward considerably, significantly between 312, when his head is perfect, right, and 313, when it blows up. And 
so we went down to confirm or disconfirm what what Marcus uh, was saying. And I ended up carrying a second carousel projector. And I can remember to this day, this is July, how hot it was and how heavy that damn projector was as we made our way from a parking lot to the to the archives. So we go in, we watch we watch the Zapruder film and and then we put set up the projectors and did it. And and we confirmed it. It was there. It was clear clear as anything that there was a forward head movement at that point. <laughs> Although somehow or other we failed to understand that there was also in the same frame a blurring movement, which meant that that Zapruder had moved his camera, right? Had moved his camera. And we never thought that the forward movement of the head, since it was we measured on a very bright part of the thing, was caused by the camera moving, not his head moving. Gee, one of the great mistakes I ever made in this case. So it all, it all started there. Now, you got to be a life consultant for a little while, which gave you access to high quality Zapruder transparencies, and that helped you along the way as you began to develop what became Six Seconds in Dallas. Yeah, you know, many things in human life are absolutely accidental. And that's, that's how this happened. Vince Landry and I were gonna write something for Harper's or the Atlantic Monthly or something like that, you know? But Vince hated to write. <laughs> I, I like to write, and I was on summer vacation right, as a professor. So I, I started writing this up, and pretty soon, of course, Vince and I began disagreeing on, on evidence. Vince was persuaded that the hole in the front of Kennedy's throat was caused by an incoming shot from the front. Right? Made no sense to me, because the spinal column is about that far from the entry, from the so-called entry hole. Uh, so we, we broke up over that. But I, I pursued it, and I had an introduction to Willie Morris, who was the editor of Harper's Magazine. So I traipsed up to New York one morning and got there by 10 o'clock in the morning, I guess. And Morris couldn't see me until 5. So what the hell do I do now? Well, there was a Don Preston was the um, managing editor for Bernard Geiss Associates. Now, you probably never heard of Bernard Geiss Associates, but, but he, they published this, this wonderful book. Wonderful book, it was an awful book. Um, uh, about, about the high life of, of a bunch of women. And it sold like crazy. And so they had a lot of money. And it was a small, small publishing outfit. But they distributed through, through Random House. So I, went to, so I went up to see Don Preston, their, their lead editor, who was uh, a friend of another professor at Haverford, who had told him about what I was doing on the Kennedy assassination and, and was interested in it. So we talked for a while, and then he absented himself and came back and said, Bernie Geis and you and I are going out to lunch now. So we went out to lunch. And Bernie said, look, uh, you're writing a book for us. So the advance was 500 bucks, right? 500 bucks. But they would pay expenses, which was important. So that's how it all started, by accident, mm -hmm. by, by complete accident. The first uh, 100 pages or so of Last Second in Dallas is really an autobiographical look of how Six Seconds in Dallas came about. I do feel, considering where we are tonight, I feel compelled to mention that of the, the three gunmen that you place in Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination in Six Seconds, one of them is right here on the roof of the right. Dallas this County is the Records roof, Building. This is the roof of the Records Building, or what was the roof of the Records Building, yeah. Now, uh, we, we don't have time, of course, to go into the full history of Six Seconds, but I do want to touch on something kind of interesting. It is considered a classic today, somewhat of a rare book, 
because it wasn't very successful when it came out in 1967. You ran into some legal trouble and that affected how, how, how much or how little you were able to make on that book. Oh, absolutely. We were sued by timing incorporating. Now, that's a hell of a problem. And I, as author, was stuck with all the costs, of course. And actually, the costs exceeded what, what my royalties would have been. We, we sold about 75,000 copies of Six Seconds. Um, but, uh, oh boy, we won. We won summary judgment against Time Life, and they did not appeal the judgment, which is amazing, because they appeal every judgment against me. Yeah. We won it in the Southern District of New York. The judge was Inzer B. Wyatt, who gave a stinging uh, comment on, on the whole thing and decided that our use of the Zapruder film, we didn't use photographs, we used artist renderings, and that that was covered under fair use. So there was, there was no case here. And uh, hey, so won the case and lost all the money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and those charcoal sketches uh, from those Art, Zapruder right, films. They're, right, they're, you have them. We, we do. We're honored to have them in the museum's collection, and we consider them works of art. Even oh, really? though, uh, for you, it was a, a, a necessary evil because you weren't allowed to publish the original frame. That's right. Yeah. I don't want to take any more of your time tonight because you have a very thorough presentation okay. to give us. So uh, you're going to go to the podium now. Okay. I will be back for a Q&A at the end. You should have some note cards in front of you. If you have questions for Dr. Thompson at the end of his presentation, we'll be back here. We'll try to take as many of those questions as we can. So thank you, folks. Now that's a strange title, isn't it? The granular account of the last second. Granular, you know, what a strange word to use. Well, that has a special meaning here and I wanna get into that. When you speak of a granular account, you often hear TV commentators use that term and all that means is they're getting down to a level of detail. It's a general idea of getting down to it. And that's, that's probably true. But the Oxford English Dictionary defines granular as, strangely enough, consisting of grains or granules. Sure. The Random House Dictionary defines it as of the nature of granules, grainy, or composed of or bearing granules. OK. For 35 years after I quit the academic profession, I made my living as a defense investigator in criminal cases where granular might or might not describe what you knew of the field of evidence. Being a good investigator was not something you could learn going to school. You can't go to school to become a private investigator. In California, to be licensed, you have to have three years of investigative experience that are certified. Um, so, uh, I was lucky because uh, I found somebody to apprentice my myself to, and that's how you do it. It's a feudal system. You apprentice yourself to somebody who you can work under that, their watchful eye as you learn how to do it. And I was, again, lucky, just lucky, accident. I apprenticed myself to a guy who became legendary in the trade. He died a few years ago, and his name is David Fetchheimer. And uh, we managed to work on various cases around the world uh, after, after I learned my way around in the business. He used the word granular, and that's why I'm using it now. So it has a special meaning for me. Um, he used it when he explained to me that most mistakes by an investigator have to do with the fact that they haven't gained a sufficiently granular or detailed understanding of the field of evidence. Uh, only when your knowledge reaches drilled down to that level are you in a position to take advantage of the fact that any given event happens in one way rather than another. 
only when you grasp, grasp the fact that every event is singular can you also grasp its correlate that only one scenario, one scenario accommodates all the evidence and is therefore correct. As long as your understanding of the evidence remains generalized or hazy, you can't pursue one of the most important questions that any intelligent fact finder asks. If A and B happened, then what else follows necessarily from that? That question opens the way to a wider and deeper understanding of the case where whole new regions or families of evidence may be discovered. Now, Fetchheimer's principle might be summarized in one, in one short sentence. The tiny facts are the important ones, the tiny facts. But given the extraordinary volume of evidence in this Kennedy case, what part of it lends itself to the application of Fetchheimer's principle? The answer is obvious. Had the shooting stopped short of the last second, say with Zapruder frame 312, Kennedy would not have been killed and his attempted assassination would have ended up as a speed bump on the way to Kennedy's second term in office. Since Abraham Zapruder's camera was running at 18.3 frames per second, frames 312 through 330 define the last second of the shooting. It is during this last second that an important change to the field of evidence has come about, which increases our chances of success in applying Fetchheimer's principle. So what's that change? That change, quite obvious, is that during the last second of the shooting, the Zapruder, Zapruder's camera makes its closest approach to the limousine. The limousine is coming down, it gets closer and closer and closer, and right about 312 or so, that's when it makes its closest approach. Well, <laughs> that means the details that are now available, which were not available earlier on when the car was two or three times farther away, now these details are available. So by applying the lesson learned from Fetchheimer, the tiny facts are the important ones, to this last second of the shooting, I aim to produce a factual scenario that changes understanding of the whole event. This scenario will not just show that Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill the president. It will rather show that he could not have killed the president, okay? Our task requires that we put the last second of John Kennedy's life under a microscope. Murder is a grisly business. I've done a lot of them, and Kennedy's murder especially so. But we are doing this out of respect for Kennedy's life in the conviction that the truth of his death will illuminate that life. This, we should never forget that the granular level is always arduous for working in. It is always much easier to discuss an event in the generalities of political debate. But granular details of what happened that day are crucial, not only because they tell us what happened, but also because they point, they point in the direction where new facts may be discovered. Now, that was the introduction, folks. Let's go on. This, so my uh, talk with you tonight is gonna have five parts. The first is dealing with frame, three thir famous frame, frame 313. And <laughs> tiny facts, where the various parts of flesh and brain matter and blood went. Now, surely that, that subscribes to Fetchheimer's principle of going for the tiny facts, right? Then I got some civilian witnesses who we can see in various photographs are standing erect as spectators and after 313, throw themselves on the ground, which by itself makes some interesting witnesses and I wanna tell you what they said. The most interesting witness in the case, of course, is Sam Holland. S.M. Skinny Holland, 
right? And I interviewed him in, uh, on November 30th, 1966. Had a wonderful time with him. Now, finally, we get to the second shot, which is, this is all new, frame 328, where, again, we have a whole lot of impact debris evidence that I think establishes at least the direction from which the shot came. And then finally, a few final remarks. Next slide, please. So section one is going to be tracing where the blood, brain, skull, and all that went at Zapruder frame 313. Now here we have Alkins 5, which was taken by uh, Alkins at Zapruder frame 255, which is about three, almost exactly three, three seconds before the 313 shot. Now, before getting into this and explain, explaining the photograph to you, I want to point out that what you see happening almost every time in any Quentin Tarantino film is actually what does happen when somebody is shot and the bullet doesn't stop. Obviously, if you're hit by a bullet and it stops in the body, that's basically it. But if it goes on through, you end up with, with a big blast of blood and b bone or with headshots, brain, brain matter, up against the wall. And that's what Tarantino and other filmmakers are showing. Hey, that's true. That's, that's what I want to tell you. That is what, what happens. The blood and gore in the wall is studied through what's called blood spatter analysis. It may be able to tell you, for example, where the bullet was fired from and even the number of inches above the floor the barrel of the weapon had to be when it was fired. For obvious reasons, this kind of analysis only works when the crime scene is indoors. Um, and there's a wall to be struck by the bullet and the other impact debris. In the Kennedy case, we had no wall, but just the memories of various individuals who were hit by blood, brain matter, or skull fragments. But that turns out, folks, to be quite enough. Like these people. No, no, leave it up, uh, Gary, please. There we go. Now, you see where President Kennedy is? He's in the right rear seat. And you see just to the left in the, in the frame is Jim Cheney riding the inboard cycle on the right hand side. Out of frame is uh, Doug Jackson. But now we go to the people who were hit with impact debris. The two motorcyclists clear out here. Now notice the distance between, between President Kennedy and uh, Cheney. Here we go. Whoops. Well, <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, Here's President Kennedy, and here's Cheney. Maybe, what do you suppose that is? Six feet or so, something like that. And these two guys, I'm gonna be dealing with the, the blood spatter on these guys first, but notice how much more distant they are. To give you an idea, it's 12 feet from there to there. Each of these lanes is 12 feet wide. Okay, let's go to the next. These are the people that Officer Bobby Harges is riding the inboard cycle. Officer B.J. Martin is riding the outboard cycle, both of them on the left side, on the left rear of the vehicle. Secret Service, Secret Service agent Clint Hill was standing on the uh, running board of the follow-up vehicle right behind. And when the shooting started, he jumped off the, the vehicle and ran to the presidential limousine. So he's coming up the left-hand side, right? Agent Sam Kinney was actually driving the Secret Service follow-up car, which is maybe five feet, six feet at the most behind the limousine. Officer Doug Jackson, and Officer James Cheney were on the other side, on the right side. Now, it's important, I'll just mention right away, and we'll get to it later, but 
Jackson and Cheney were untouched. Neither one got hit with any, any material at all, whereas all these other people did. The first, uh, the first four on that list all, all got hit. And right now, we're going to go to the first one, Officer Bobby Hargis. Now, this came from a reporter who talked to Hargis on the next day, uh, November 23rd. And he tells about, as the president straightened back up, he gets hit. And he, he got hit in the side of his head, says Hargis. And then I felt something hit me. It could have been concrete or something, but I thought at first I might have been hit by a bullet, right? Then I saw the limousine stop and I parked my motorcycle at the side of the road and got off and drew my gun. Well, next slide, please. Uh, this again is now from Hargis's sworn testimony. Um, he now tells us that um, I, st I stopped and got off my motorcycle and ran to the right hand side of the street behind the light thing. Okay, now, next slide, please. Here's a photograph of Hargis doing exactly that. There's Hargis. See? Now, actually, he's run. When this photograph was taken by Wilma Bond, he had run all the way over here by this light, light fixture here and run back. There's his park cycle right there. So what's important here is that we have photographic evidence that Hargis did exactly what he said he did. And he did that for these reasons. Let's, next slide, please. <laughs> oh, oh, this is the worst. Um, this is from uh, the Texas Monthly, and a reporter talked to uh, another officer named Bud Brewer. And Brewer said, Bob, that is Bobby Hargis, you got something on your lip. And then he, Hargis, did like that. He flicked at something on his lip, and it was a piece of Kennedy's brain and a piece of skull bone. Oh. So let's now look at both of them. Here are the, here's Hargis on the left-hand side here, and here's B.J. Martin. So let's see what B.J. Martin had to say. Next slide. I'm going to read this, because this, this turns out to be one of these tiny facts that tells you the whole story. And I'll, so, so let's pay attention to this. This is what he said under oath in, in his deposition. I pulled off my helmet and noticed there were blood stains on the left side of my helmet. It was just to the left of what would be the center of my forehead approximately halfway, about a quarter of the helmet had spots of blood on it. There was other matter that looked like pieces of flesh. There was blood and matter on my left shoulder of my uniform and just below the level of the shoulder. Now, why, why the left side? Why the left side? Because his right side is closest to Kennedy, right? Here they both are. Here's Hargis, and here's his right side. This is Martin here, and this is Hargis. Notice their right sides are closest to Kennedy's head. Okay. Well, for years, decades even, <laughs> uh, I wondered about this, but I didn't do anything about it, right? But this last year, a good friend of mine, Doug, Doug DeSales, did something about it. He lined up all the photos of the limousine and frame 313, and it became apparent quickly that Hargis was riding between Martin and Kennedy. In other words, Hargis actually pr produced a rain shadow right here, what, what, what in, in weather talk is a rain shadow when, when a mountain uh, prevents rain, uh, the other side of it. Uh, okay, so let's move on. 
This fact, tiny fact takes on great importance alongside Hargis's report that he was hit so hard with the impact debris that at first thought, at first thought he had been shot. These two reports establish the high speed, and that's the point of all this, the high speed of the material blasted to the left rear. This was no amorphous cloud of blood and brain material from Kennedy's head floating in the air and that the two motorcyclists wandered into. This material was blown to the left rear at such high speed that Harges ended up shielding the right side of Martin's body, helmet and cycle from it. Note that all this happens when Harges is at least 15 feet from Kennedy. So it's the speed, the velocity of all, the, of all this debris that is really important. Next, we have a couple Secret Service agents. We have Clint Hill, who is right there, running between the two cars. And we have Agent Sam Kinney, who's driving the Secret Service follow-up car, maybe five to eight feet behind the presidential limousine. So let's deal with Clint first. But just like an eruption, blood, brain matter, bone fragments, everything you can imagine, you know, come, up coming out of the head. He says it was like an eruption. As he was running up on the left-hand side, he got hit with all this brain, brain debris and everything else. Well, I was able to find a couple of Zapruder frames that actually show this. So let's go to the Zapruder frames now. I don't know if you can see it right there and right there. These are Zapruder frames uh, 334 and 337. So I can show you that, but uh, his testimony is, is very vivid and uh, very real. Let's go on. Now, this was taken on Main Street a couple minutes before the shooting when the when the motorcade is still up there. Notice where Kennedy is on the right side. Here's Hargis, and here's Martin. Here's Clint Hill, and here's Sam Kinney. Right? Okay, we've dealt with Hill. Now let's go to Sam Kinney. Yeah, Kinney said in this, that Kennedy's head was blown out. Clint Hill, Clint Hill and I, unloaded him from the car. There was nothing left. It was the whole back of the head, as far as I'm concerned. I saw it hit, and I saw his hair come out. I had brain matter. This is the important. I had brain matter all over my windshield and left arm. It would be his left arm that extended out over the door, as, he, as we often do, ride with our arm out the window. OK. Next slide, please. Now, this has to do with fragments. This is 313, and this is fragment one and fragment two. Now, you can't recognize fragments in the air. But uh, unfortunately, this, the position of Z Zapruder's camera doesn't adequately explain much about these fragments. For example, any, any movement to the left is very difficult to discern because you have this straight on shot from the right. So here's where the here's where the cars were going, right? And one fragment was found here in the gutter that's oh, and the other was found clear down here. This this is very likely the Weitzman fragment which was number 1. And this is the Harper fragment. The Harper fragment was about like that. It was a good, good hunk of, a good hunk of skull. And so you really need to know where these frag, where fragments landed. And you no, know, you can't be sure. You can't be certain of this. But it, but we do know for certain that here with the Harper fragment. You had, you had a fragment from the, not the occiput, but 
but from the top of the head that was oh, that the FBI agent who who took custody of it said that he was told that it, it was picked up in the grass and picked up in the grass 25 feet from where Kennedy's head was at that point. So you have a fragment flying 25 feet. That's a lot of energy went into that hit, right? Okay. Let's go to the I guess it's about time now to show you the Zapruder film, because that's what I'm talking about. And if I didn't show you the Zapruder film, you would absolutely know that I was hiding something, right? Well, I'm not hiding anything. Let's, let's go, Gary. That's the first film. We have a second one, too, of, of the same, same period, only in close-up. Yeah, yeah, give it a second shot. Ooh, showing. Okay. Do you want a third? Yeah. Do it a third time. Okay. 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 Once again, it's clear that Kennedy's head and body are thrown to the left rear by the bullet's impact, just as earlier we saw the impact debris blown in the same direction at very high speed. Don DeLillo viewed the Zapruder film many times in preparing his novel Libra and noted how its very existence denies official opinion. And he, here it is. I, f I found this in an interview in Paris Review where DeLillo says, are you seeing in that frame, 313, are you seeing some distortion inherent in the film medium or in your own perception of things? DeLillo asks. Or are you the willing victim of some enormous lie of the state, a lie, a wish, a dream? Or did the shot simply come from the front, as every cell in your body tells you it did? Well, that's what I want to say, too. I look at that Zapruder film, and there's not a doubt in my mind where that bullet came from. It came from the right front. And next slide. Um, now, neither of these two officers got hit with anything. Obviously, if that 313 shot had come directly from the rear from the depository window, these are the officers who were close to it. If it had blown out the, the right front of his head, these officers would have had, they weren't. Okay. Now here's what Doug, Doug Jackson said. He, he said that and it's interesting to see, I mean, some of the officers were looking for reporters right away, and they dealt with reporters right away. Not, not Doug Jackson. Um, he wrote his memory of the whole event in his child's, I think it was an eight-year-old child's notebook that she got at school. And finally, the, this was obtained by various people and, and published. Here's, here's what he said. But he's not looking for, for publicity or anything. He wanted to make a record of what he'd seen. And he said, I looked back toward Mr. Kennedy and saw him hit in the head. He appeared to have been hit just above the right ear. The top of his head flew away from me. That is, in that direction, towards the left, which matches what we expect, right? The fragments went off towards the left. Everything went to the left. OK, next slide, please. Yeah, I didn't get anything on me until we got to P Parkland Hospital. When I got there, of course, I got some blood on, on me from helping him, being the president, out of the, out of the car. So he's, he very explicitly says that. Now, Cheney, 
I got to tell you that uh, various reports had had surfaced in the early 70s that Cheney had observed that. So I I got in touch with the son of the author of the book, who was very kind, and sent to me a digital copy of the interview, the where Kenny. Cheney is alleged to have said this. He didn't say anything like this in the, in the interview. There is no cre credible evidence. There's no evidence anywhere. Gary Mack of, of this institution checked all the outtakes of interviews that Cheney gave on the night of the 22nd at headquarters. There's nothing there, either in the outtakes or in the broadcast things. So you just have to take my word that Cheney wasn't hit, and he's so close. He's when we saw him in that uh, Alkins photo, he was he was right up in here. So, next one. Now these are civilian witnesses, and uh, first the Newmans. I saw Bill Bill Newman here on on Dealey Plaza when filming a documentary not not long ago. And um, so these are the last two, well, three witnesses on the north side of Dealey Plaza. That's the side of the Zapruder pedestal, et cetera, et cetera. These are the last two. By the time uh, Elm Street got to this point, there are very few, few spectators. These are the last two. So let's see, see this map, and you'll see what I mean. There, there are the Newmans, and there is Hudson. Notice there's nothing here from here on down. Okay. These, they both remained erect until after the 313 shot was fired. Then they both threw themselves on the ground, the Newman couple protecting, protecting their children. Um, now here's what here's what Bill Newman told me. This is an interview I did with Newman again in November and then in December 1966. Yeah, this is Warren Commission testimony from from, from him. And you see how cl wait a minute. Here's what you told me about yeah, here here is Newman. Here is Kennedy, and this is almost at the instant when Kennedy is hit at 313. Very, very close. Newman is maybe six, eight feet at the most from, from Kennedy when this happens. And look at what he says. The president, well, of course, the president's being shot on the right side of the head by the third shot. By third shot, he means the next to last shot. I thought the shot was fired from directly above and behind where we were standing. And that's what scared us, because I thought we were right in the, in the direct path of gunfire. I interrupted him to ask about this whole description of his head, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right, he interrupts me and says, my thoughts were that the shot entered there, and apparently the thoughts of the Warren Commission was that the shot came out there. For decades, yeah, I believed that the shot came out there, right? These are the mistakes that we've made for decades, and that people who were right there, eight feet away, said exactly the opposite. Next slide, please. And this is again Newman. When the president, and this is his, this is his affidavit, which he filled out on the afternoon of the 22nd. When the president was directly in front of us and I was looking directly at him, when he was hit in the side of the head, the shot had come from the garden directly behind me. I do not recall looking towards the Texas School Book Depository ever. I looked back in the vicinity of the garden. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Now we deal with Emmett Hudson. Here's Emmett Hudson. Emmett Hudson was sort of the groundskeeper for Dealey Plaza. His job was maintaining the fountain at Union Station and maintaining the grounds at Dealey Plaza. 
these two people we don't know. They just happen to be standing alongside of him. Now, this is just after Kennedy was hit at 313. They're all erect, right? And this, that afternoon, Hudson went into the sheriff's office and executed an affidavit. Um, he said he didn't know the names of these people who were standing with him, that they just butt there. He said, the shots that I heard definitely came from behind and above me. OK, next. The FBI showed up at, uh, at Hudson's place uh, on the 26th, that is, well, five, six days later. And they brought along the Dallas Times Herald with this photograph. This is a Mormon, the famous Mormon photograph. And um, this is what the FBI said. He said, the shots, this is now he's reporting what, what Hudson said. The shots sounded as if they were fired by someone at a position behind him, which was above him, and which was to his left. Well, let's look. There's, there's Hudson. Behind him would be up in here. Let's see, above him would be up in here. And to his left would be very close to the corner of the fence. Okay. We'll see how important that is later on when we get to it. But, but basically, these two people are not able to tell us exactly where this shot came from. They would say it came from within that uh, ovoid shape. Hudson. And as you notice, uh, the Newmans were on the ground at that point. This is some some time after. This is the same same shot we had before. Yeah, he's sitting now. He he's just getting up. Right. The Newmans are flat on the ground still. Okay. Let's go to the next. Oh, Sam Holland. Oh, boy. Great. Um, next, please. Now, this is where Sam Holland was, right? Right here. And he was, well, I'll get to him in a later. Next slide, please. That's Sam on the overpass. And here is the Lee Bowers tunnel. Now, probably. Some of you know who Lee Bowers is. I just didn't have time to de deal with this. But Lee Bowers, in this tunnel, was looking at the backside of the stockade fence. Right. And he said that um, he found two people who were strangers to him. Now, Lee Bowers had been in this tower for eight years or so. And he knew all, all the railroad personnel. So when he says they're strangers, it means something. Lee Bowers, I think, felt he owned all, all of this railroad property. And he would keep track of people, right? So he said, at the time of the shooting, there was some sort of commotion up near the corner of the fence. And, um, and there is Holland showing us uh, where he heard about well, We'll get to this in a minute. Next slide, please. Sam Holland, at home in Irving, his picture in 1966. Now, Hollands told us that it was the sound of the next to last shot, which immediately drew his attention to this, this area here. And almost simultaneous with this strange shot, which was, he described it as the difference between a 38 and a high-powered rifle. And this, this from the, from the, about the corner, of the, near the corner of the fence, was quite different than all the other shots, which seemed to come from up Elm Street, up near the corner of Elm and Houston. At the same time that he heard that, and his attention was drawn there, he noticed a puff of smoke, which has been very controversial. But folks, before we throw out the, the puff of smoke at somebody's imagination, you ought to know that eight different people besides, besides Holland saw smoke in this general area. 
and, and later reported it. So this is, and, and he said, the smoke was just about the size of a foot stool, maybe eh, 12 to 18 inches. And it sort of wafted out for, at fence height. And because the bank broke off and broke down, by the time that, that photograph was made, uh, let's go back to it. That area was about eight or nine feet off the ground because the slope broke down, downward. So right under these trees, right, right under the exact spot, that's where it was. Just like somebody had clump, I don't know what he meant by this, but it's what's there in the text, had clump a firecracker out and leave a little puff of smoke there. Now, the House committee, Kern, the associate editor of Life, was with me during this interview. And we had agreed on the way out that we were going to give Holland a hard time if we found, if he said anything that we didn't think was true. So Kern started going, going after Holland on this. And Holland, Holland handled the whole thing brilliantly and told him the, hate, the exact same thing that the House, HSCA, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, learned um, uh, how many years later, in 1978. They employed experts to tell them whether this was plausible or not. And the experts said, yeah, I mean, smokeless powder isn't smokeless. You do get, under certain conditions, a little white smoke. And under these conditions, with filtered light coming through those trees, it was perfect to be able to see that sort of thing. OK, next one, Gary. Now, so we spent five hours, four or five hours with, with Holland at his home. But then we made arrangements to meet, to meet Holland down at Dealey Plaza on the Saturday. So he's now showing us, I think, the most important thing he did. Look, Holland didn't just observe this. He didn't just remember this. He acted on it. He came running off, as he's doing here in, in reenacting this, running off the uh, overpass to, to his left. And then, and he's got uh, three other railroad people with him. So this, this bunch of guys come running off the overpass. They have to climb over a, 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 a heat pipe of some sort. One guy falls down on the ground. They have to climb over all this jumble of cars because this wasn't really a parking lot. It was railroad property, right? And and that, that's what he reenacted for. It's, it's wonderful. He's wearing his hat, and he's wearing his overcoat. Uh, I'll tell you about Holland now. Because you deserve to know who he was. I mean, and something about him. He was 60 years old. This guy was 60 years old in 1966 and had worked for the Union Terminal Railroad for over 10 years and other railroads for an additional 30 years. He was a longtime citizen of nearby Irving, Texas, where he coached Little League Baseball for years. He was a personal friend of Sheriff Bill Decker, who authorized Holland to carry a concealed handgun for 16 years as a special deputy. He and his wife didn't have any children of their own, and they raised three adopted children, one of whom became a policeman. When, when Ed Curran and I visited Holland's really modest home out there, Holland told us of the efforts made by the um, FBI agents who came to see him. He, 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 by that time, had had endless visits from Secret Service agents and, and FBI agents trying to get him to say, well, I might have made a mistake. Maybe there were just three shots. And he would never do that. He maintained doggedly that he heard four and possibly five shots. He tangled with commission counsel Stern when, at his deposition, where he said, 
I've also told those two, four, six federal men that had been out there to see me that I definitely saw the puff of smoke and heard the report from under those trees. I mean, he's a tough guy. He, um, but, and he's an odd choice to be a government gadfly. But Kern and I, we, we, wanted, we wanted to see him, we wanted to interview him because we had to know for ourselves the importance of what he was saying was really great and we needed to talk with him directly. Uh, he could have been some cranky old codger who wanted to get his name in the paper and stick it to the authorities at the same time. So we had to know. And unlike earlier people who came to interview him, Kern and I were prepared. Kern had read his affidavit, and I'd read both his affidavit and Warren Commission testimony. We, were, we decided on the way out that we were going to give him a hard time if there was anything to give him a hard time about, and then drill into the story. We came away from our multi-interview convinced of the accuracy of his, of his memory and his credibility as a witness. The transcript of our interview, which I'm going to give to the museum, is 71 pages. Holland's story of what happened is simple. He had some welders doing work up near the overpass. And one of the two Dallas policemen up there asked for his help, asked Holland to be the guy who would determine if anyone was going to have a chance to stand on the overpass. The overpass was right over the car, right? So he didn't want any bad actors there. And only such people who, who Holland approved, because he knew him, could, could come, come up on the overpass. He heard two or three shots that sounded like they came from the upper part of Elm Street. He was pretty sure there were two, but there might have been three. Then there was a pause of several seconds and two more shots. The first of these two hit Kennedy in the head and threw him backwards and to the left towards his wife. This shot was different, not as loud as the others. I told you, it sounded like a 38, Holland said, as compared to a high-powered rifle. Then right away came the final shot, again like the first two, but from the other end of Elm Street. He said of this next to last shot, it came from behind the picket fence up on top of the grassy knoll. And about the same time, there was a louder report that came from up the street. And they were so close together, you could say they were just, and he snapped his fingers once, twice, about a second, about a second between them. And of course, the House Select Committee's Acoustics evidence is that they were exactly three quarters of a second apart. So he got that. Look, what I want to tell you is I was amazed to reread this 71 page transcript. Now, I hadn't read it for decades. Holland got it almost exactly how I, in any case, believe it happened right now. Got it almost perfectly correct. Okay, let's go through some, some more photographs. Now, this is what the stockade fence, the, far, the railroad side of the stockade fence looked like in 1966, okay? Looked like that, okay? And now, Holland and I made this diagram. Now, you see, between those two arrows, there's a horizontal line and then a vertical line. That's the corner of the fence. And Hall, yeah, right there. That's the corner. That's the corner of the fence. That that's how it looked in 1966. And notice, but car number two, there are all these footprints. Well, it had rained the night before, so the ground was all wet, and they found these these footprints in the mud. A whole lot of them by car number two. Now that's what. It, maybe eight to 10 feet from the corner of the fence, something like that. And then one set went down between them and the other, et cetera, et cetera. We decided to meet Holland down at the, in Dealey Plaza. And you can see we made the appointment still on that piece of paper. <laughs> coffee coffee at, Union, at Union Station. I can't read the rest of it. Can you? <laughs> Saturday morning, right. So we met him down there on Saturday morning. And uh, I got Holland 
to stand behind the fence because I had something I wanted to do. And look, I was no trained in business. I was a stupid little assistant professor of philosophy at Haverford College at that time. I was no train, trained investigator at all. But I had something that I wanted to do. I wanted to show him, uh, I, I wanted to find out where these footprints were. Now, he, he's testified about them, but that's vague. I, I, I wanted, so I asked Holland to go and stand by the fence at the exact point where he found the footprints and the fresh cigarette butts and all of that, right? And uh, so he did. He went from his position behind the fence, and I took his picture. That's the picture I took, right? And in the circle, you can see Holland in his hat. <laughs> you see? There he was. OK. Well, that's, remember exactly where that is. Is can you see see him in the hat there? Okay. Now, let's go to the Mormon. This is a Mormon. Okay. Here's there's 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 Holland, right? You got it. That's where Holland's standing. This is this is Holland standing on here in the, in this photograph. And what is this? Right. <coughs> okay. Let's go to an enlargement. See that? See that? I don't, now, see that? OK, so we looked into this a bit, and we learned this. You see this, this vertical shape along the fence line and along the top of the fence? That's that tower in the background, a fixed feature of the site, right? There is the tower, still there as it is in the Mormon photograph. But when you look where this shape is here, right, there's nothing there. It's not a fixed feature of the site. So whatever that is, I call it the anomalous shape. Modestly, I call it that because I think it's the top half of, of the gunman's head. OK, next slide, please. There you go. There's the shape. There's Holland. So what we knew, this is what I wanted to test. I wanted to, to test whether Holland's footprints were in the same position that this guy was. And they are. I'm going to test it. Next, please. OK, the last shot. Now, it's all downhill from here. It really is all downhill. Next slide, there. There is an enormous amount of evidence about this. These two bullet fragments were firearms ID'd to the rifle found in the TSBD, right? Here is an impact point on the windshield, on the interior side, the back side of the windshield. Here is another. Here it is right here. Another impact point of a bullet fragment, again, on the rear side. Um, Bob Frazier of the FBI lab started his forensic examination of the limousine about a little after 1 o'clock on the morning of the 23rd. And these are his notes, which, which basically tell There's an, this massive amount of evidence of a bullet hitting Kennedy's head and throwing stuff forward. So, throwing stuff forward. Please, next slide. Here, here we go. Now let's follow this. Between 321 and 322, Kennedy has been thrown violently backwards and to the left. At this point, between these two frames, his shoulders hit the, the vertical seat, and he bounces forward. So he bounces forward here, and here, and here, et cetera, and here, right? And here. These are all bounced forward. And at this point, 
something has happened. And I'll show you in detail these three, three frames. And I'll wait until I have larger frames to, sh to show you. To show you. Um, next slide, please. Here we go. 327, nothing there. 328, there it is. And there it is in 329. A, a bunch of gore has been blown out the front of Kennedy's head and is now dripping down in front of his face. There. Okay. These are just for record purposes, 331, no, 332, 33, 35, which is very grisly, and, 30, 30, and also 337, very grisly. Next slide, please. I'm rushing because I'm almost out of time. <laughs> okay. So the argument here is that after, after the 313 shot, there are parts of Kennedy's head that are visible in the Zapruder film. And after 327, that is 328, 29, 30, and, and on, and on, they disappear. So the obvious presumption is they were blown out by, by something that happened between 327 and 328. And that's what this is meant to show. Next slide, please, Gary. So I measured the speed of Kennedy's head between 322, 322 and and 326. That's before this change occurs, and it turns out to be just under an inch per second. I measured the velocity after 320, from 327 through 330, and the velocity had doubled. Now, why would, if somebody bounces off, off the seat, right? Why wouldn't he maintain the same speed or even go slower as, as he got farther from the seat? No, this is the opposite, which says something happened here between 326 and 327. Yeah, something happened. I, he got hit in the head. <laughs> OK, next slide. This is the change in half a second. This is 327. This is 337. And uh, the changes are enormous, really. Now, next slide, please. So this, we believe to be the, the last shot, came from the depository window and struck Kennedy in the back of the head and threw all this stuff forward. Next shot. Next slide, please. Okay. Go, next slide. Okay, this is the next to last shot. 313. At 313. 313, thanks, Gary. Next slide, Gary. Now, this is an expansion of that shot, and we'll give you a close up of, of this. Here's where, here's where all the impact debris went, right? And here's where, here's where we think is the angle of the incoming shot. Now notice, I, I, I want to caution you on this. You can't just draw a line down the middle of where the impact debris was and take it back up out the other side and continue that line. Because where the impact debris goes is a function of two causes. One is the incoming bullet and where it came from. And secondly, various weaknesses in the skull the sutures in the skull, where they held or didn't held, and, and the actual skull injury. So you can't do that. But look how close it is. Where, I mean, where, where um, I mean, we didn't cook this, is, is what I'm trying to tell you, because it doesn't mean that much ultimately. But this is where we think the shot was fired from. Next slide. OK, this is the last shot. Next slide. We think it came from the depository up here. And the witnesses over here tell a very different tale. The witnesses over here who are down here, like um, um, Altkins himself, who is down here, to take another picture, and the friends and family 
think the things came out of Kennedy's head forward towards them. So the witnesses down here are talking about, about Kennedy being blown forward and seeing stuff come out of his head towards them who are in front of him, where the, where the witnesses over here are ducking down because they thought they almost got hit by a shot. Next slide, please. Last shot. Here it is. Here's the depository up here. And here's its impact. Next slide. Now, we switched to the HSC hearings. This is an official document of the House Select Committee on Assassinations that was published in 1979 after the committee went out of existence in the early days of January. I want to call your attention to this. What this says is location of unknown gunman. Next slide, please. Okay. Note where this is and note where this is. And what I want to tell you is this location was reached by Weiss and Ashkenazi after they reenacted the shooting in Dealey Plaza and thus tightened up, tightened up where the, where the shot was, was fired from. Instead of it coming to play in for a shot to count, instead of it having to count within six milliseconds, plus or minus, they brought, brought it down to one, which is really a tiny window for, for your shot to do. Yeah, this, this came off the work the acoustics experts were doing. And they located the 313 shot as being fired from that location. And look at our location. Yeah. In 19, yeah, 12, 12 years later, this work using science of acoustics, for God's sakes, something I never thought of, right, uh, confirmed what, what I thought back, back then. Next slide, please. That's it. In other words, at the beginning, the Warren Commission, and I guess most of us all thought, that, that Kennedy was hit with... I didn't. I thought he was hit in the head by two shots, but, but most everybody thought he was hit in the head because of this impact debris, which is clear and obvious. You can't miss it. You have bullet fragments in the car and you have them hitting the, the interior back surfaces. And only now do we understand that this fits 313 and this fits 327, 328. Okay, that's, that's all I got, and I'd love to answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, let me say first, I haven't been teaching a class since 1976. Man, it's great to be back in a classroom again. <laughs> it really is. All right, Tink, let's go. Approximately how far down the stockade fence do you feel was the shooter's position? Eight to 10 feet from the corner. Eight to 10 feet west of the corner. All right. Oh, here's an easy one. <laughs> how has the Kennedy research community changed since the 1960s with the internet and self-publishing? Oh man, I, I don't know. Look. I gave up on this at one point. It was 19, when was it? 1979. And uh, I had just managed to get my detective license, which meant I could go off on my own, I could go off on my own, but, but I didn't have any clients. And Peter Dale Scott had a book contract with Random House to do a book on the House Select Committee. So he assembled three of us to join him in writing this book. And we would, we'd get some money, right? And I would get a free set of their volumes, which was nice. So I looked into the evidence at that point, and I came away absolutely shocked. Because it was clear to me now that the field of evidence, which sort of made sense back in 1967, 
didn't anymore. It was heterogeneous. It was in conflict. The, and what that meant obviously was some of this evidence was only so-called evidence. It wasn't authentic evidence. But how do you judge between them? I, I couldn't judge between them. So I looked at that and decided, well, I better get to work with my detective business. Do you still believe the throat wound was a fragment wound and that uh, CE-399 was the bullet that lodged in the back? Um, let me take the throat, throat. We're fortunate to have Gary Aguilar, MD, <laughs> doing, doing the Look, Kennedy assassination research is, is a, it's a team sport. It really is. From the very beginning. I mean, back in the old days, there was a very small community of people who trusted each other, who worked together. And we, we did pretty good work back then. Pretty good work. Wasn't perfect. We made a lot of mistakes, too. I personally made lots of mistakes. But it's good to work together on this because you won't be able to think of all the reasons you're wrong. That's the first thing about research. Like, like this. You got to have criticism right from the beginning or you waste your time on silly things. And uh, well, I don't know. That's... Did you want to address uh, CE399 and the lodging in the back? Uh, Gary and I have written together <laughs> an article on CE399. Why don't you tell them about 399, Gary? Well, the, the one thing to say about 399 is that most of you know it was flattened slightly at the base of the bullet. Um, otherwise, it's essentially pristine. Um, people who do forensics work, Cyril Weck has done 45 or 50,000 autopsies. Says whenever a bullet's like that, even uh, jacket bullets go through fabric. Fabric impressions are left on the surface of the fabric. On it. There are no fabric impressions on it. Uh, the first four people in the bullet's chain of possession were later shown 399 and said, Did you see this bullet on the data assassination? We're talking about the two people in Parkland Hospital. Uh, O.P. Wright, who had a lot of experience as a police officer, uh, Guy Tomlinson, who found it and showed it to O.P. Wright, Ben Johnson, spelled with E. M. Johnson, his first Secret Service agent who got it from him, and then Rowley, the chief of Secret Service, they were all shown 399, and they all could not identify the bullet as the bullet they found. Uh, this is a multi, much longer discussion, but I think the moment that got to the FBI office that was transferred through all these people is not what is currently 399. There's, there was some switch occurred, I think, once it got to the FBI, uh, because 399 was not it. And it was not lodged in the back. Presumably, 399 is supposed to have gone through, uh, uh, first gone through Kennedy from back to, to the front, then had gone through Connolly, breaking, you know, you know, going through his back, breaking the uh, 10 centimeter segment of his fifth where then exiting his chest, going through his wrist, breaking his radius ball, which is a very big bone, really, and then the lodge came out of his wrist, lost his left eye, and did that without having been dead uh, or distorted. Um, there's lots of stuff written on this. We can read the, the magic for the moment, more magical than we knew. Um, and I think there's very good reason to think that what now exists in evidence is not the bullet. Because uh, there's been a lot of falsification written about that not least being a memo written to the uh, Warren Commission by the FBI's field office on July 7th, 1964, in which they said that, you know, that both the two guys who found the bullet, Tomlinson and Wright, they said, well, you know, we, we, you know it, it, it resembled the bullet we found that day, okay? But there's no 302 from any kind of an FBI interview of those two guys. But then an, uh, an, a report from the Dallas field office showed up later on saying that for information, neither Tomlinson nor Wright can identify the bullet. But the letter that the FBI wrote the Warren Commission said, that, oh yeah, they said that it was it. So there's a lot of falsification of record. And I think there's good reason to suppose that that bullet that now exists in evidence uh, never passed through Connolly, and never passed through Connolly, Kennedy or Connolly. And, and, and again, uh, I can only stand upon this for about another hour, an hour and a half. Hour. <laughs> hey, hey, let me add to this the fact that at least I, I and Gary see the examination now of the medical evidence in the case 
to be stage two. We, we have seen all sorts of signs that the medical evidence backs the scenario that I just gave you tonight of these two, two shots, one from the front at 313, right front, and the other from the rear at three, 327, 328. So that's stage two next year. One, one, one brief he has to support that, and that is this. And it's laying in the evidence that we've not recognized the meaning of it since 1967. And that is the Clark panel went and looked at the autopsy evidence and reconfirmed the findings of the Warren Commission. But the chairman of the Department of Radiology, uh, a guy named Russell Morgan, wrote you know, the radiology part of the Clark Commission's findings, and it said, that there was essentially a cloud of tiny fragments in the right front quadrant of the head. Well, tiny fragments don't come from jacket bullets. Tiny fragments come from soft shell bullets that break on impact, and the bullet then releases a bunch of tiny fragments in the head of very what they call high dragon tissue. In other words, a tiny fragment has a very small mass, and relative to its surface area, it's stopped very quickly by tissue. So those tiny fragments tend to aggregate in the area where the bullet impacts hard bone. If bullet breaks, if it's not jacketed immediately, tiny fragments are left out of position, and those bullets impart a lot of momentum because they don't pass right through tissue. They're stopped because it's not jacketed. And so what you see lunging back and the left is very characteristic of non-jacketed bullet movement, and it leaves an x-ray evidence. Well, where, where's the x-ray evidence? In the right front quadrant of its head, which was originally described by the chairman of radiology and then confirmed by me, I've seen the originals, confirmed by Sir Weck, who's seen the originals, confirmed by Michael Jesser, who's seen the originals, David Mantic, and, uh, and, and John Fitzpatrick, who was a forensic radiologist uh, who did the review for the uh, uh, Sasha Erica's review board. We've all seen that kind of fact, except here. You don't see that with the jacket report. You see that with the non jacket report, which supports, uh, takes pieces, that it was a different kind of bullet that was shot from there, that it, it struck. In the right front quadrant of the head, they start back forth. There are uh, several questions here asking for your thoughts on the acoustics evidence. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this one because I think it kind of sums it up pretty well. After the HSCA determined that there was a conspiracy due to the dicta belt, scientists debunked the dicta belt finding. Now that you have proven the dicta belt does prove that shots were fired, or four shots were fired, what are those scientists saying now? How, how have they responded? Who are the scientists? I, I believe these are the critical the, scientists. Of, yeah, I think the National Academy of Sciences. They haven't said a word. They haven't replied at all. They haven't said anything. The, look, the scientists, what's crazy here is uh, James Barger. If you get into physics and, and acoustics, you'll find that James Barger is a legendary figure. He, was, he first was employed in showing that the first shot at Kent State was actually fired by a National Guardsman. And he used the same, the same principles that, that the acoustics experts used in this case were the same principles he used there, and, and anyone would use. Look, the 12-member panel put together to do this ambush against Barger and, and these people, none of them were acoustic scientists. Not one was an acoustic scientist. The chairmanship of this cabal, I would say not a committee, was offered to um, Alvarez, Louis Alvarez, who had already taken a pro Warren Commission position and published an article in the Journal of Physics about it. I mean, this. You have quite a history with Dr. Alvarez. Yeah, I've had quite a history with Dr. Alvarez. But look. Someone wants to know what TINK stands for. Do you want to? It stands for nothing. Oh, my sister, look. I'm 87. My sister's 97, right? And as kids in a small town in Ohio, she was called Tot, and I was called Tink. And somehow it stuck with me. <laughs> 
We're gonna, we're gonna finish it up here with this question, which I think is really interesting because as long as I've known you and going all the way back to yeah. 1967, you have focused on the logistics of the assassination. You mean the, what happened? Yes, yeah, this right. person wants to know simply who did it. Oh. Looking at the, the bigger picture, I mean, you, you certainly believe there was a conspiracy, multiple gunmen in the plaza. Do you have a theory as to who was ultimately responsible? Absolutely not. I, you know, we know what we can know. And what we can't know, we can't know. And you need evidence. That's, that's it's all about evidence. And uh, we ignored all this evidence about the debris field from the 313 thing. We ignored that for a long, long time. And now it turns out, Joe oh, Fetchheimer was right. It's the tiny facts that tell you what happened. Hey, it's been a, a real privilege to uh, <laughs> to be with you with you here tonight. Please thank, join me in thanking so much for coming, Dr. Tim Thompson. Thanks, thank you for coming. Thank you so much.